Brent, I am so excited to be doing this podcast with you, man. We go way back, Ina. Yes, we do. We go now, way back. Now, not to give away our age or anything, but how many years do we go way back? 2012, 2013? Mm-hmm. Right? We were in Brooklyn at That's a right. seminar. You and I, both skinnier versions of ourselves, were in weaker. Brooklyn at a skinnier, weaker, probably hungrier versions <laughs> of ourselves were in the Brooklyn Starting Strength Seminar at the uh, Brooklyn CrossFit, CrossFit South Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah and uh, Rip was doing a lot of lectures at that time. Most of them. I think Steph only did... Uh, the programming lecture and the Valsava lecture. I think Rip did all of the others, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. We were very lucky. We really benefited from uh, listening to him lecture. And at that time, what were you doing when you when you attended? Was that your first seminar? That was my first seminar. That's right. And mm -hmm. what were you doing at the time for for work in the fitness field? What were you, mm -hmm. you know? Were you coaching? What were you up to? So I was coaching. Um, I worked for Focus Personal Training, um, sorry, Focus Integrated Fitness as an on-site personal trainer. So basically in uh, New York City, Manhattan, we would bounce around the city and go from client's apartment gym to apartment gym. Uh, there were a few independent training locations that we were able to take our clients and those were more fully fleshed out gym. So they would have squat racks and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of the clients that I was training, I would do sessions in Central Park um, or in their tiny little basement uh, apartment gyms or even just in their apartments, you know, move the coffee table out of the way. Here's some bands. Here's a medicine ball. Here's some tiny little dumbbells. So at the time, I really didn't have a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to practice the starting strength methodology with the majority of my clients. And uh, when we both took that seminar, one of the lectures I remember Rip giving was about coaching and uh, him saying, you know, you need to be doing this professionally if you're going to pass this seminar. I said, okay, yeah, I'm doing this professionally. I've been, you know, working in the fitness industry since like 2004. Check. All right. Got that. Uh, you need to have done this program yourself. Yeah. Okay. I got my squat up to, you know, 405 out of body weight of 180. That's, that's all right. That's not bad. Solid. Check. All right. Um, and so I remember him saying that only 10% uh, will pass. And I look around the room and there's 22 people. I said, okay, I've been here doing this a while. Uh, I'm a decent lifter. I've got my CSCS. I got a bachelor in exercise science. All right, cool. It's going to be me and one other person, 10% of 22. And I didn't pass the first time, nor should I have, because like I said, I was mostly doing on-site training at the time. So my access to uh, clients that A, had the uh, facilities to engage in proper barbell strength training were limited. And B, you know, we're talking about uh, bougie Manhattan residents. Not all of them really want to do the hard work that is associated with proper barbell training, or sure. I just, I couldn't convince them at the time, you know? So I didn't pass the first time around, nor should I have. Uh, but that's when things really changed for me. Uh, I didn't pass and, you know, I remember being heartbroken because they were doing the very first starting strength coaches conference like a few months later, okay, now I can't go to that. Okay, fine. Um, but instead of just being all pissed off, uh, I decided to double up on my efforts towards becoming a professional barbell coach, a starting strength coach. And in addition to doing these personal training sessions throughout Manhattan, I had also started working for a vocational school. That same company, Focus Integrated Fitness, launched a vocational school called the Focus Personal Training Institute, which was a state licensed vocational institute for people who wanted to become personal trainers and coaches. So I'd been teaching at that school doing the, uh, the master's course, the advanced curriculum where we got to spend some time on barbell training, strength training specifically. And we also did other stuff like kettlebells and bands, chains, right. cables, you know, all that, all that other stuff that's, that's, uh, kind of expected of you when you enter into the standard uh, 
personal training uh big box gym model you got to know how to use the various machines sure which you know doesn't take that long to figure out but you still need to have an awareness and an understanding of it and need to know all of the various uh implements that might be at your disposable at a uh, big box gym mm -hmm. so i was teaching uh at that school when i took the seminar the first time and when i didn't pass i decided okay i know what the problem is i don't have enough people mm -hmm. that are willing to do this program to help me refine my coaching skill set mm -hmm. and so what i decided to do was create a after school extracurricular barbell club so that i could capitalize um, on the student body Very that cool. was already there that was eager to learn and start coaching them from the ground up starting strength style starting strength methodology and i don't have to worry about you know their paying clients so if they don't like what i'm doing or if i fuck up can i curse on this yeah you can curse uh, okay so if i fuck up you know they're not going to quit you know, they're, they're stuck here for another three months with me, like right. it or not. So right. Right. Um, while I can't force them to attend an extracurricular thing, it was a much more lower risk um, scenario for me to develop my coaching skill set. And these were um, students of the Institute, correct? That's correct. These were so students they were, of the Focus Personal Training You had training captive Institute. audience. How did you, I, I mm -hmm. wanted to back this up a little bit and find mm -hmm. out how, when's the first time you learned about starting strength? 2009. What were you uh, doing I'm, in 2009 for exercise? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, man, you know, like I said, I've been doing this a long time. So I've tried all sorts of different stuff. Um, were you barbell uh, training at the time? Yeah, I was barbell training. Training. How did you discover, where did you see the first, this is what is starting? So how did you first come to that? Do you remember that moment? I do. Yeah. So uh, I was training with my buddy, Jason DeHenzel, big shout out to Jason DeHenzel, owner of DeHenzel Training Systems in Virginia. And uh, he introduced me to, it was the blue, it was the beige book at the time. So it was second edition and that was 2009. And uh, I remember prior to that, I was doing all sorts of shit. You know, I did West Side Barbell for Skinny Bastards by uh, <laughs> who was that? Joe DeFranco. Um, I mean, you know, I was just kind of doing your standard program hopping, going from one thing to the other. I did uh, Martin Rooney's training for warriors. Right. And, I remember that. Yeah, man. None of that stuff. Okay. I got a little stronger. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, but none of it worked nearly to the degree. And, and we hear this so many times, it almost gets just numbing and boring to hear, but nothing else worked the way that starting strength did. That's, That's just right. That's just Fact. how it goes, man. Fact. Fact. And when you we were hear that um, so frequently, you talked about how you know you had that reality check when you were at the seminar, and I was with you. I had the same reality mm -hmm. check. I had mm -hmm. no hopes. That was my. I had no hope. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I was an aerobic instructor at the time. But mm -hmm. um, what is it at the seminar that you think you failed to do that you needed more experience with? Yeah. So uh, two main things. Uh, coaching eye. So uh, seeing the deviations, and I was able to see a, a large majority of the deviations. But I also had except for on the power clean, I was not prepared, my mm -hmm. coaching eye really was not capable of, uh, of seeing uh, the deviations and and bar path and not just deviations bar, path, but why those deviations occurred. So if somebody loops the barbell. Right. Well, was it because they're, you know, they were starting a little bit forward of the midfoot. Was it because they jumped early? Uh, you know, so not just seeing the deviations, but why those deviations occurred, particularly on the power clean. And I was decent enough at the other lifts at, as far as seeing the deviations, but I really didn't have the two next things. The two next things being hierarchy of those deviations, which ones are more important. And this is common amongst all new coaches, all green coaches, they see the most obvious thing, not necessarily the most important thing or the thing most germane to the lift. So like in the squat, I was messing around with the guy and we hear this all the time. I was messing around with the guy's grip and I wasn't fixing his back angle or hip drive out of the hole. You know, 
something along those lines. Priority keepers, um, yeah. We, we, were, we didn't know yeah. that there was a priority to these things because we didn't really have a model to reference in any other right. types of training. So right. this is exactly. new to us. It was new to us. In other texts, it's just, you know, checklist. Yes. Yeah, like, it's a checklist. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And there wasn't a structure to this thing is most important. This thing fixes a whole bunch of these other things. So focus on that first. Mm -hmm. Nobody else does that like we do. And what gave you, what, what did you do to help yourself fix all these things that you were lacking? Just a volume of trainees, um, the experience of coaching more people. When you went back to try to, mm -hmm. to get better at this, what was the thing that really helped you? Was it watching videos, reading the book again, training more people? Mm -hmm. What was it that really made the difference? A few things. Um, I did those things that you mentioned. I went onto the forums and I went to the Starting Strength Channel uh, forum and people post their, uh, uh, their lifts for feedback. And so I would evaluate the lift first, make my own notes in the order of importance. And then I would scroll down and see what the official Starting Strength coaches would say. Um, rent reread the book of course by that time the third edition had now come out because now we're talking 2013 versus when i was initially introduced to starting strength in 2009 and that's four years in between and i did a whole lot of uh fucking around in between there you know doing other programs and gaining weight and losing weight and you know going getting back and abs. forth on the yeah getting abs you know that's stupid stuff um, and, uh, and I started training more Brazilian Jiu Jitsu back then too. So that cool. was a, that was a fun thing that I was doing. Um, how, long once before, I, how long before you took another seminar? Six months. Six months. Were you more Maybe prepared less. then? Well, I passed the second time. So it must've been good. So the things that I did were, you know, those things that I was able to do at home self-study, um, but the two biggest things that had the impact of me passing the second time around, it might've only been four months later, actually. Um, but uh, the two things that I did was I started that after school barbell club, and that allowed me to get my hands on more people that uh, were willing to do the program, that were willing to learn. I still have, I still have videos from those very first barbell That's club cool. sessions, um, including one of our very own Ryan OCP. Yeah, that's right. was one of my first students and who has, uh, you know, then later on to become a starting strength coach. And he is one of, I believe, five starting strength coaches that I've worked with and helped very through cool. this uh, process of becoming a starting strength coach. Um, but I did that. And in addition to that, I hired a starting strength coach. So I paid out of pocket uh, every week to be coached by a starting strength coach and working with a coach helped me significantly in the delivery of my cues in the uh, breadth of my cues. And it allowed me to also ask them, um, right. you know, with, problem areas like listen i'm i've got one of my students this is happening i really don't know how to fix it i don't know what to do or i don't know what to do with this guy's program or what do you think i should do right. and those two things were the absolute biggest uh changes that i made between the first seminar where i failed and then the second seminar where i passed I have a lot of uh, people who are interested in becoming a coach at starting strength gyms. And um, one of the things I do recommend to them if they're not ready for the prep course is that they hire, they take advantage of the starting strength online uh, coaching because mm -hmm. like you said, they could hire a coach if they can afford it. Um, they can hire a coach for one cycle and get feedback on their own lifts and learn from how the coach is, is correcting them and really you know benefit with uh, with this until they have enough trainees. Now, 
speaking of that, I know that you've uh, coached, you've trained a lot of apprentices, you've raised a lot of coaches. Um, I get a lot of questions from these apprentices as to, you know, what's the one biggest thing I can do right now before I join the prep course that would make me successful? Uh, what's the one thing they can do in terms of preparing to be in the prep course, to benefit from it? What would you say that one important thing is? Two. Two, two. biggest things. Okay. Work with the starting strength coach mm -hmm. and coach clients yourself. Clients that I agree with you. I told them the most important thing is experience with lifters. Get your eyes on as many people as you can, which like you and I know is very difficult during COVID. Um, so I'm having people train grandmothers, you know, whoever they can train. Um, and they always ask me, uh, how many people do I need to be training? Um, how many people do your apprentices uh, coach before they can really benefit from the prep course? Before they can benefit from the prep course, like I think they can they benefit. For, I think they can benefit from the prep course right away. But they have to have trainees. They do. Right. How many trainees does someone have to have going into the prep course? I don't know. Yeah. So some ask me, is two enough? You know, and two to me seems know. very little. Uh, you it's, only yeah, see. Very little. You've got to see more than two people move, you know? So that's one of the questions that come up. And I said, you know, you got to have at least like five to 10 people that you're watching move, you know, um, mm -hmm. you've had experience with, because like you said, you had to develop a whole barbell after school club just to get mm -hmm. enough experience. And if you mm -hmm. only had two people, you would have never passed the platform. Yeah. I didn't have that many people in the barbell after school program. How many though. did you I'm have? I think I only had two. In fact, I had Ryan OCP and I had, uh, uh, what's his name? Greg. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, that whole class was only three students, maybe four students. Mm -hmm. So some of the others would kind of come in inconsistently, but uh, you know, also remember I'm still coaching clients too at the same mm -hmm. time. Yes. You have so, a lot of people you're, you're moving with. Yeah. Not, not all of them are doing starting strength but I can at least apply the concepts mm -hmm. of starting strength and continue to develop my coaching eye, even if they aren't doing, you know, strictly barbell training. Now it doesn't work as well. I can tell you that right now, mm -hmm. but I can teach them the, uh, the coaching, sorry, the teaching methodology of the body weight squat. Sure. That's how we begin mm -hmm. the squat platform. So, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm still, even though I only had two people in that barbell, maybe three or four people in that uh, after school barbell club, um, I'm still seeing a lot of bodies. And that's the thing is lifters, uh, sorry, uh, prospective coaches need to see a whole lot of bodies mm -hmm. because even if it's just the anthropometrics of it, somebody with a longer torso versus a shorter torso is going to look different. And you need to be able to train your eye to see the difference between the two and understand the difference between a difference in anthropometrics versus a deviation in the model. And that takes time and that takes exposure and repetition. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, there's also just people of different personalities. That's less important for the platform. Um, it's important for me as an employer <laughs> that you got to be able to mesh well with a variety of individuals. Yeah. Um, but uh, differences in physical ability, meaning that if somebody is really gifted and, you know, you only have to tell them one time how to do something and they can figure the rest out on their own, those lifters, those clients don't actually benefit you nearly as much as a coach as your motor morons, your physical idiots, those people that you have got to come up with a new way to cue a certain or instruct and then cue a uh, deviation in movement um those are the people that teach you new things and uh force you know, that creative yeah man and and that's an interesting thing about the starting strength gyms see at the seminars we would usually get out of the out of a cohort of 25 to 30 people we would maybe get two or three people really usually not more than two or three people that were just complete motor morons yeah. that just, you know, far left-hand side of the bell curve with physical ability 
and uh, kinesthetic awareness. At the gyms, and I love my gym members, guys, I love you, but there is far more than two to three out of 30 people who have no awareness of what their body is doing in space. Makes you a better so, coach. Oh my gosh, yes. My coaching skill set has never been as good as it is right now as a direct result of running this gym. As a direct result of running this gym and coaching other coaches and what to look for and what to see. It forces me to verbally articulate how I am looking at the lift. Previously, um, previously on the deadlift, for example, which in my opinion is, is one of the hardest things for your coaching eye to fully develop and crystallize what the model is, even though it's only five steps, mm -hmm. there's just, just tiny subtle deviations and where the lifter's weight is on their foot changes the back angle, changes the shoulders. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tiny deviations in, in the bar being just this much further away or closer changes the shin angle, changes where the shoulders and the hips are. Mm -hmm. So uh, previously, all I could tell you was that looks right and that looks wrong. Mm -hmm. And now that I've had to articulate, okay, why is this right? Why is this wrong? I can now say, well, look at the shin angle Mm -hmm. and look at the shoulders. Mm -hmm. Sure, the shin angle looks right, but why are their shoulders way out over here in front of the barbell? It's because they're on their toes. Mm -hmm. There's no other explanation for it. Mm -hmm. Come rock back, we'll drop the toes. Boom, see that? Mm -hmm. Now the shoulders are just slightly in front of the bar. Bar's directly under the scapula. Shin's still at 10, yeah. 15 degrees incline. That's what we're yeah. looking for. And, and you know, you talk about the benefits of being in the gym. Um, how long were you a coach before you opened a gym? And, and I mean, Brent, congratulations. I, you haven't just opened up one gym. <laughs> You're on the way to open up how many? Tell us. Goal is 20. The goal is to have 20 gyms. 20 uh, gyms, Brent? We've wow. got Dallas open right now. It's been open uh, since July of last year. We opened the doors with 34 members that had committed to their intro session and their first month of training at the gym. So they're, they're dropping, you know, $500 sight unseen. Uh, first starting strength gym in, in Dallas, uh, second starting strength gym in existence. The first one in Austin had only been open for, you know, two or three months prior to us opening up our doors. So these people are, you know, they understand the, uh, position and impact of the brand of starting strength and they want to get more involved they want to lift at a starting strength gym they want to work underneath the umbrella of a starting strength coach uh, so we opened up in july of 2019 i've been a starting strength coach since 2013 and i've been on seminar staff since 2014 and seminar staff we're the guys who you know help operate these starting strength seminars and determine if somebody is operating at the level of a starting strength coach should they decide to opt in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been doing both of those things for a while at this point. Um, and I remember back in 2015, after a seminar, we're sitting in the hotel room, you know, we're drinking uh, whiskey with Rip as we, as we tend to do. And Rip looks at me and said, Carter, what are you doing in New York? <laughs> what are you going to do? when the power goes out and they blow the bridges up and you're stuck on the island. On an island, you will be eating each other in five days, okay? Um, and I'm originally from Texas, so yes. that you know, started to get the wheels turning a little bit. Uh, so I started saving money. Um, and the goal was always to, since, I mean, not always, but since that point on, the goal had been to open up a gym, a barbell gym and uh, associate in some way with starting strength and do it in Texas. So uh, I started researching where in Texas. I went to Austin, to San Antonio, to Dallas, and uh, Dallas seemed like the best choice as far as uh, market goes. And it's also halfway between my parents and my sister who's up in Oklahoma. Um, so I wasn't sure at that time whether I wanted to open up an affiliate gym or a starting strength gym, franchise gym, because prior to just, you know, 
sure. not even a year before me moving, um, those that idea wasn't really in existence just yet. It was the model the, was. Why did you choose the franchise gym? Specifically, why did you choose to open a starting strength gym, like you said, versus an affiliate versus anything else? Um, opportunity. Opportunity. Uh, I knew that there would be a, a more streamlined avenue for growth and development with a franchise gym. What I didn't realize at the time was how much um, support was on the table from being a franchise gym, from working with Ray and Ben and Jen and now you. So having that support behind me, um, I didn't realize the, uh, the impact that that was going to have on me as a business owner. Um, I think I would have made a whole lot more mistakes, probably wasted a whole lot more money and taken a whole lot longer to get to where I am right now, where we are poised to open up two gyms at the same time in the first quarter of 2021, and wow. then far, far more gyms uh, beyond that. We've got the area development rights for all of DFW, uh, which includes three gyms, so We've already got the the papers to open up that third gym in the DFW, so you know that wow. means uh, that means four gyms uh, right there. And like I said, the goal is to get up to twenty. So man, I love hearing this. I love yeah. hearing it because you know I, I love to see you know one of my friends be successful and happy and and you know. It's, you know, and like you said, listen, I opened an affiliate gym and I, it cost me a lot of money and mistakes. And I, if sure. I could do it all over again, I'd be opening up a franchise because, you know, it say it would have saved me so many mistakes. And yeah. I love the way the franchise looks. I love the design of it. And uh, I love the team I work with, but um, you, you're going to have an opportunity to employ a lot of people. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking about by the time you're done. We, you have potential of hiring upwards of 80 people and sure. a lot of apprentices and you have a lot of mm -hmm. experience training app apprentices. So tell me a little bit about what you look for in your ideal apprentice, because I tell them there's a lot of people applying for this, but we only choose mm -hmm. the best of the best. So what makes them the best? How would they know if they are ready for this? What do you look for in an apprentice? So there's a few things that I look for, you know, there's what you would expect me to respond with, which is uh, tenacity and drive. They have to be uh, willing to, um, in a way, willing to be self-taught because I can't hold their hand their entire time, nor can my staff their entire time they're at the gym. So they have to be willing to come up with their own questions to ask us, mm -hmm. why did you coach it this way? Why did you cue it this way? So on and so forth. So there needs to be a self-driven motivation factor there. So, um, you know, that's, in my opinion, that's one of the most important things. And then the second thing is they have to be able to get along with everybody, you know? Like if I do an interview on Zoom and I just get this kind of weird or off vibe, I'm not interested right. because I can't, I can't teach that. I can't teach somebody how to be a self-motivated individual uh, and I can't teach somebody interpersonal skills. I think it's something that people can improve upon. I absolutely do. Uh, but there needs to be enough self-awareness first to understand that these are things that have to be worked on. Yeah. Um, you know, barbell training is inherently uncomfortable. We are pushing people um, that goes against that little tiny voice in the back of their head that says, man, this is hard. Why am I doing this? You know, <laughs> so having a coach that you can connect with on some personal level makes a big difference. Um, you know, uh, through my years training uh, people, teaching people at the uh, Focus Personal Training Institute, there are some people who have the book smarts, they have the coaching eye, they know how to get the job done, maybe they're strong themselves, but they're just awkward, and I really don't want to spend any time with them, and our teams, you know, they coach together, and we do meetings, and 
I do events with these guys. I do con ed workshops. So they need to be able to get along. They need to be able to, you know, even better than get along is enjoy each other's company. And the members have to enjoy their company as well. So uh, those are things that I'm looking for. Yeah, need to be able to connect with you and, uh, and your personality. Um, you as an individual need to be able to modify and tailor your approach and your personality to the clients that are in front of you. I think that's something that, uh, that, that good, successful personal trainers do very well. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I had to do for years was know who my client is, know who my audience is and tailor, you know, the topics that I discuss with them and be able to carry on a conversation. Uh, I think uh, a lot of us starting strength coaches, um, less so now that these gyms and opportunities are open, mm -hmm. but a lot of us starting strength coaches began our career doing the personal training gig. Mm -hmm. which means that after we do a heavy squat, man, we got three to five minutes to kill. Yeah. Uh, are we just going to sit around awkwardly? Cause I'm not going to be on my phone cause I'm a professional, right. but the client, if I don't have something engaging to talk about or connect with that client about, they're just going to be on their phone and it's going to be awkward. And I'm just going to be, mm -hmm. you know, sitting here watching my watch and that's yeah. boring. Oh, it sucks. Yeah. And, and that's a good point about the distinguish, uh, distinction between personal trainers and being a starting strength coach. I can remember myself trying to fill that rest time as a trainer and it was, oh, painful. God. but then oh, when I became a starting strength coach, I actually had something to teach in between mm, the sets true. so that each set yep. could get consecutively better. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that also adds value to the, to the trainee because mm -hmm. they're learning. And that's one of the features of starting strength gyms that I think is really important. And people need to know about is that these are places of education. It starts from the mm -hmm. coach and it goes all the way through to hosting camps and seminars. Uh, you mm -hmm. have, you hold uh, camps at your, at your gyms, correct? Uh, single lift camps, any coaching development camps? We have not yet hosted a camp mm -hmm. for uh, for the outside, like yeah. people that are uh, non-members. Mm -hmm. um, for my staff, I host at least one Con Ed event per quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, I ramped it up a little bit last quarter, so I had two. Um, but we've done events for both staff and members like uh, a few months ago i had darren deaton come in and he did an awesome workshop big right. shout out to darren dr darren deaton starting strength coach and doctor of physical therapy out in fort worth go okay. see him if you need physical therapy riata uh riata uh, rehab clinics uh -huh. physical therapy something like that uh -huh. he's gonna hate me um <laughs> so he came and did an entire presentation on uh, injuries what to do when they happen not if because if you train long enough you're going to get hurt regardless of how safe and careful you are mm -hmm. it's just going to happen you know um, but what to do when that happens so i had him come in um before that i had michael wolf come up from austin and do a con ed event with my staff on programming post novice linear progression what to do as they're transitioning into intermediate training um last month i had uh Nick Degodio come up and do a squat development workshop. Now that's maybe one of the things that you're talking about, yeah, but yeah. this was a closed, this was a closed event. Yeah. This was for my staff only. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that I like to do as a, as an employer and business owner is I like to provide uh, opportunities for continuing education. Mm -hmm. So a couple of weeks ago, I had Josh Wells come up and he did an Olympic lifting awesome. uh, workshop. Again, this, this, these are things that could have been offered to the general public, and we probably, you know, could have made money on these things. Instead, I spent money mm -hmm. on developing my staff, and man, I'm a okay with that. So he came up, and we did uh, the Olympic lifts from, you know, uh, snatch, power snatch, split snatch, full snatch, and then same thing with the clean and uh, and jerks. So it's good. This is what I'm trying to explain to apprentices who. Um, 
have never, we you know they might have interned somewhere else where all they mm -hmm. did was run around getting coffee oh, and God. running errands. And I explained to them that it's starting strength gyms. It's a different environment because we're mm -hmm. not interested in babysitting you. Mm -hmm. um, right. And th they have so many opportunities to learn where they would have to struggle to do this on their own. And that's why this is such a coveted position is because they have access to an education that will prepare them, you know, and get them ready for this credential where then even stand alone, this credential is making them money, but they can really have a full career at a starting strength gym, but you fully educate your crew. And a lot of apprentices are surprised to find out that we're this invested in them. And I mm -hmm. think that it's, I think that it's a highlight of the gyms. You really do a fantastic job. Thank you. Well, it's really about um, everybody having their interests aligned, right? I mean, we're all, you know, operating on the principle of self-interest. I have a, a vested self-interest in staffing my gyms with the very best coaches in the world. And I believe I do that. Um, so I'm invested in developing them as coaches uh, for that reason. Um, and for the fact that as we continue to grow and expand, I will need to continue to have at my disposal a level coaches absolutely at the top of the game um, and so it's incumbent upon me that i both find that talent and i develop that talent and i nurture that talent and as a result of that these um these coaches will have now have uh, more opportunities at their fingertips, mm -hmm. um, whether it's with me or with another starting strength gym or affiliate gym. That's a highlight, um, I think, of, of the gyms in general, is that is that system that you provide for them that prepares them and how they mentor each other. You have really mm -hmm. like a mentorship. They are following mm -hmm. a starting strength coach and it goes all the way down from a, from a green apprentice. And I thought maybe you can give us a sneak peek into, you know, what they make along the way, what are some, you know, what, what they can expect to make, uh, what's the process of apprenticeships, what do you expect to see out of them, you know, six months in, three months in, when they're new, you know, what do you expect of them, that they're training, they're reading the book, they're in the prep course, mm -hmm. that they're attending mm -hmm. seminars, they're passing the platform, like, you know, what do you look for that are markers of like, okay, this person's going to graduate and go to the next level? And mm -hmm. what can they uh, expect to make along the way? Well, there's, there's really two filters that we have to consider. And the first filter is the apprentice's um, current state of readiness in regards to their coaching skill set and their ability to take on more responsibilities. The second filter that we have to consider are availability of coaching positions at the various gyms. Now, as we continue to grow and expand, the second filter becomes uh, less of an issue. Um, that said, there are quite a few starting strength gyms that are opening up that are actively seeking head coaches. So, for example, in the Dallas location, uh, I am the head coach at that gym. And there is only one head coach at any given gym. Um, the financial model would not support paying more than one head coach at any given gym because the head coach is the that and rent are the two most expensive resources and it should be that way mm -hmm. um it should be that way uh full disclosure i don't actually make what a head coach what a head coach makes because not. i'm the owner that's <laughs> but, you know that's just that's just how business goes yes the two biggest expenses at the gym are rent and staffing mm -hmm. and it should be that way because we have the very best coaches in the barbell game, in the strength training game. That's how we have positioned ourselves. That's why, why we are able to do this. That's why people are looking for uh, places to train at these starting strength gyms. But with that said, I might have more than one qualified candidate for any given position at the gym, but that's not dissimilar from really any employment opportunity. You might have more than one candidate that's capable of doing a job and there's only one job available. Uh, again, that said, you know, there are numerous starting strength gyms opening, uh, you know better than I do, then uh, can speak to the need for finding qualified candidates 
that are head coach material because that goes beyond just having the starting strength coach credential. When you take on the role of head coach, you're taking on mentoring. mentoring. You're taking on sales aspects. And by sales, what I what I really mean is it's not like a you know the the standard personal training like what can I do to get your business today you know right. that kind of thing. By sales, I mean demonstrating value, being able to speak to the value, building a vision mm -hmm. of what that client can look like, what they can do three months from now, one month from now, six months from now, a year from now, building that picture and that vision and being able to demonstrate the value of what we do, which is coaching, mm -hmm. which is completely different than giving access to a gym. Mm -hmm. That's why a membership at a starting strength gym is going to cost over 10 times of what it would cost for you to go down the street to LA Fitness. But if you don't want to coach, go down the street to LA Fitness. That's true. That's there. But if you don't want to coach, it's because I failed to demonstrate the value That's of right. having yeah. a coach. So, you know, the head coach is, is uh, got to have more skill sets than just being an amazing starting strength coach. They have to understand the value of client retention because client yep. retention is just as valuable as getting new customers. That's our lifeblood. That's that is right. our lifeblood. And Every client that comes in the door as a prospect costs us a certain amount of money. That's right. And it is much much more cost effective to keep a client than it is to try to turn over a new one. Yes. And they have to be able to know how to do that. And you said something um, right before this, where you can have an apprentice in one gym that might find work in another gym. Like you've raised apprentice, you've raised uh, coaches mm -hmm. who have studied under you, but then might find work in another gym. And that's really unique to the system mm -hmm. that we're not competitive with one another. And we work mm -hmm. for the greater good of the brand. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that, uh, you know, about that process of becoming an apprentice. People contact you and mm -hmm. you know very well that they might not be working in your gym, but yet they still become part of your system. Um, and, and, you know, what is that like uh, for them, mm -hmm. for you? How, why are you even comfortable with that? What's the benefit to the gym to raise someone uh, who might not be even working there? Well, it's a good problem to have, really. Um, I don't think it's going to be much of a problem for me because mm -hmm. if I'm going to open up 20 gyms, I need to continually be developing new coaches um, that are also willing you know, to move to a different city, perhaps. So I've got one of my apprentices here uh, at Starting Strength Dallas. He's been with me for you know nine months to a year. And uh, he's shown a lot of promise. And uh, we're talking about moving him down to San Antonio. That's so great. That helps me out because I've already got somebody who's been immersed in the culture of starting strength Dallas, which I desperately want to replicate at these other locations. The sense of community that we have at the starting strength Dallas is overwhelmingly amazing. You know, when we were shut down for two months, we still retained like 78% of our members. No other, no other type of gym can do that. No. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've built an amazing community here and I don't know how we are going to replicate that, but that is the task that is the charge and it must be done. So that's really going to help me of, of, of plucking somebody from my current, uh, my current ecosystem. And then, you know, rooting them over here kind of like when you take a succulent and you know take mm -hmm. a leaf off the succulent and it grows right. and it's the same plant so cloning what we've done in dallas mm -hmm. um he's going to really help me with that so I'm, I'm definitely looking forward and excited to that um but you know i think at some point we'll we'll probably reach a uh, position where we're kind of homeostatic in regards to our rate of growth and expansion Maybe not, I don't know, but if we're just going to consider a scenario like that, if I was only interested in opening up one gym here in Dallas and I'm fully staffed, mm -hmm. um, it's always a benefit for me to have some type of funnel going on because that's just the, the nature of life is things are going to happen. Maybe somebody's really not uh, you know, as invested in barbell coaching as they once were. Or maybe they just got an amazing opportunity somewhere else. Maybe they want to go somewhere and open up their own gym. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, man. 
Um, so always having a, a, a pipeline of people who are interested in becoming starting strength coaches and coaching at a gym will always be of importance to me. But uh, based on the rate at which people contact, uh, contact me in, in being interested in being an apprentice and being developed as a coach, if I was only interested in opening up one gym and I'm fully staffed, I'm the head coach of the gym, I mean, what else am I going to do with these people? Mm -hmm. You know, just say, no, you can't move anywhere else. you got to continue to uh, apprentice here at the gym, even though I don't have any positions open for employment. Right. That wouldn't be okay. You know? Mm -hmm. So I tell everybody when they get started with me, I say, listen, I talk about those two filters. I say skill set and job opportunities at the gym. They may not always line up. Okay. Um, you might be more than qualified to go into um, a higher position than where you're at right now. But if there's not a job opening, there's not a job opening. And, um, you know, there's, you can make a couple of decisions from there. Um, decision number one is, hey, I'm going to stick around and uh, see what opens up. And in the meantime, I'm going to make myself invaluable so that the head coach, the owner would be an absolute fool not to promote me into these one of these positions. Or I can take what I've learned so far the skill set that I that um, was developed at this gym underneath the uh, mentorship of these people here, and I can seek my fortunes elsewhere. Either is fine with me. Mm -hmm. Either and, you is know, completely there, okay there, with me. There is a tremendous benefit for them also because let's talk about the fact that their training uh, ha is being overseen by an SSC. You Listen, know. they're they're getting free school. That's yeah. what they're getting. That's right. I mean, basically, they're getting free development. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they are getting, I mean, yeah, they have to pay for the coaching pipeline, uh, the coaching prep course rather, but. Well, they're getting that? free coaching. First of all, they're, they're getting, getting free, free coaching. coaching. And uh, then they get to have their training, uh, you know, reach whole new levels when they're being monitored by an SSC and they're getting all of these skills that they're, they're learning following. Um, and so mm -hmm. a, a lot of these, you know, people are used to having the old way of doing an apprenticeship where you were just a nuisance to the gym and you went and got people coffee. They don't realize you're going to be teaching mm -hmm. them like a technical, you know, mm -hmm. a technical skill. And then from there, you know, they can, they can uh, move forward or they'll be employed by one of your facilities. Um, to add to that, <clears throat> uh, I've got a cleaning crew that comes into my gym every day, every day except Sunday. And this, this might not be the same across all starting strength gyms, but, uh, you know, I want my apprentices focused on developing as coaches, mm -hmm. not worrying about cleaning a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, there's some checklists that they got to help me with. They got to take out the trash and clean the mirror, do a quick walk through the training floor and the bathroom and make sure it's presentable. But, uh, you know, they don't have to do any significant or substantive cleaning because i've got a cleaning crew that comes in every single day yeah. i want my coaches focused on one thing and one thing only being the best most amazing coaches in the world mm -hmm. you certainly provide them that opportunity and and what can they expect to earn let's say when they come in and they're green and they be, then they become a coach what are some what are some what's a pay scale and what are some numbers that you can throw at us so they can get some idea uh so what i can tell you is that starting out they're not going to get paid a dime mm -hmm. starting out mm -hmm. your compensation as an apprentice is me teaching you that's right is me coaching you and if you don't think that that has any actual dollar bill value to it you are a goddamn fool <laughs> I'm I teaching you a skill set that you will possess as an asset as a barbell coach. Not that to is something a free membership. Not to, yeah, sure, fine. Free membership, okay, cool. But uh in regards to investment and getting a return, I mean uh it's <laughs> it's free education. Yeah. Yeah. It's free education. It's preparation. Yeah. It's preparation it's, for them. Yeah. This is where they build their base and then they get to, you know, with it, pursue their credential. And mm -hmm. without, without gyms like yours and, and coaches like you who are mentoring them, they're going to have to figure this out on their own. 
And that's a lot harder, as you and I both know. And this is priceless. If I could go back in time, if you could go back in time, man, to be in a starting strength gym and part of this apprenticeship process, ah, God, it is just absolutely valuable. So I think that it's one of the- Saves you a whole lot of money. I mean, I've got a degree in exercise and sports sciences for all that it does me, you know? Mm. And, you know, college is cool. Sometimes it's fun. It's the first time away from your parents. I was not uh, mentally uh, mature enough for college at 18 to move away from my parents. I can tell you that much right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Wasted a whole bunch of time, wasted a whole bunch of money. Um, So if if you know that this is what you want to do, then we are providing you a streamlined funnel pipeline into a lucrative career. So if you want numbers, a starting strength coach who is also a head coach at one of our gyms stands to make close to six figures. Wow. You know, that depends on a few factors. It depends on their tenure. It depends on the gym's performance. It greatly depends upon the gym's performance. But like I said before, the head coach isn't just coaching. The head coach is also ultimately responsible for retention and uh, converting, uh, helping to facilitate the conversion mm-hmm. of new mm-hmm. members. So, they have to be a big part of the business and they have to show their worth and they have to have experience mm-hmm. coaching. And also you have to have time and experience you know, as an SSC. And as that mm-hmm. grows, your value grows. Um, and it's, right. it's, a, it's a tremendous opportunity that you're going to be providing for a lot of people who desperately need work now. And this is such mm-hmm. a quick and direct path to achieving something that teaches you a skill that you can make money with. Um, I would say it's relatively quick. Right. Relatively, relatively quick. quick. When you compare this years. to, yeah. When you compare this to trying to figure it out on your own oh. or worse, yeah. going to a university where they don't even teach you how to do the barbell lifts. Mm. Five years I spent at university. Probably could have been done in four. I took five. It's fine. Me too. And we didn't go into the weight room once as a class. Nuts. Not one time was I instructed on in how to teach a deadlift. Yeah. Kids are coming out of school now and they don't have that experience. Um, unless you're in John Patrizzo's class, in which case, hey. lucky. <laughs> lucky. Very lucky. lucky. But opportunities like that are few and far between. Yeah. Whereas the opportunities of these starting strength gyms, as we continue to grow and expand into Cincinnati, into Chicago, Oklahoma, into, Oklahoma, into LA, Idaho, into Boston, into mm-hmm. Idaho. Oh, into so exciting. It is so Seattle. Exciting. It's, it's absolutely thrilling to be at this point. And, and for me, I love, you know, getting people connected to these positions, giving them a future, doing something they love. Um, a lot of people who might be watching this are like, don't really know uh, the footprint of the starting strength gyms and what kind of equipment you have in there. I get that very frequent question. And I know that different gyms have different um, uh, amounts of platforms in them. And mm-hmm. so can you talk to us a little bit about what the starting strength gym has inside of it and what makes it unique? Um, well, the first thing that's pretty darn unique about the starting strength gyms, especially when compared to even uh, starting strength affiliate gyms is that there's a standard look, a standard feel, a standard trade dress. You know, just like you go into, uh, just like you go into a McDonald's, you got the same menu being served, with some small deviation. Um, it's the same feel, and it's the same kind of look to it. Uh, so that's one of the the biggest differences between um, the affiliate gym model. And sorry, sorry, gym model is affiliate gyms can, you know, pick whatever color they want. And sure, there's there's flexibility and freedom there. You know, mm-hmm. maybe if I don't want my walls the pure white color as is called for in the uh, starting strength uh, build out guide. Okay, fine. I got to swallow that and just do pure white. So there's some handcuffs involved when it comes to mm-hmm. opening up a franchise gym versus uh, uh, your own gym and then affiliating it. But I tell you, 
those handcuffs are made out of gold mm-hmm. because people recognize the giant sign that says starting strength. Mm-hmm. 13% of our members are, uh, our 99 members found us via driving past it. So the other significant difference between the setup of an affiliate gym and the setup of a starting strength gym is that all the starting strength gyms take place in a commercial retail space. There are some affiliate gyms that have chosen to do that as well. Um, the reason that most don't is because rents are higher. Rents are significantly more expensive in a retail space like we have versus an industrial use or a mixed use facility. You might be able to get rents that are less than half of what I'm paying. Mm-hmm. Like I said, two, big, two biggest expenses are rents and staffing costs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, if 13% out of 99 found us via the location versus something that they would not find if I was tucked away inside of a a mixed use or industrial area, um, that more than covers the difference in rent. Yeah. Yeah. The brand, the brand is strong. The brand is strong. So square footage, we are in Dallas, 1500 square foot, the location that we're, uh, that we're currently in negotiations with, uh, in Plano, 1600 square foot, uh, we'll have uh, eight squat racks in Plano and an Olympic lifting platform, two bathrooms and a uh, changing room and a utility closet because the layout is more typical of a retail space in that it's more like rectangular. Mm -hmm. Our Dallas space is a little different in that it's more boxy Mm -hmm. um, width and uh, width and depth wise. So even though it's 1500 square foot, if it were perfect dimensions, we could fit the same number of racks in there. But because it's more of a box, we have six racks and one Olympic lifting platform in the lobby area. Um, mm-hmm. While it has the same construction and materials, um, it's it's positioned a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. So in and Boston, gotta... that's going to be a real interesting build out. Yeah. That'll, that'll yeah. be fun to look at. Looks beautiful. And your equipment is all starting strength equipment, rip design. Oh, yes. Correct. Oh, yes. Starting strength racks that uh that were designed by mark ripito produced for us by texas strength systems out of san antonio starting strength barbells that again were designed by mark ripito produced for us by buddy caps out uh, in irving texas which is uh you know within the dfw area so that's pretty cool Mm -hmm. and uh, the platforms by rips design uh custom built and, and constructed here for our gyms uh, plates we'll be getting from Grant Brogy mm-hmm. out of the uh, Strength Co. out in California, mm-hmm. and those are really sweet. And I'm very I've much. Got a to I've those. got a set. I've got a set. It's beautiful. Oh, jealous. Oh man, nice. it's beautiful. Yeah, and uh, what I tell people who ask me about the Starting Strength Gym is that the Starting Strength Gym franchise, when you walk into one, it feels like the book has come alive. Oh sure. Because you see all of the things, the writing on the wall, rips quotes mm-hmm. that are motivating. And I love how you have the design of the movements on the walls mm-hmm. also. Um, yep. It is, it's, I think it makes the place really special and it really brings about like rips, you know, motivation and, and, and the simplicity, but, you know, just the fully function you know, beautiful function and just simplicity. It's designed so well. And when you're a lifter, it's like, it has everything you need and, and nothing that's a nuisance, no mirrors, no garbage mm-hmm. in the room, you know? That's right. That's right. You know, it's, uh, as you say, the book comes alive. The, mm-hmm. If you just look at the cover of the book, the two main colors on there are blue and red. Mm-hmm. and uh you know that's what you see at the gym blue red and white and uh rips dry straightforward sense of humor yeah like on one of our walls we just have three words easy doesn't work you know right. that's just right <laughs> it's the culture of the gym you know it's oh, it's the culture exactly. of the brand it's simple it's strong mm-hmm. it, it's useful and we don't have time for nonsense. And, and I think That's that right. carries through to the apprenticeships and, and to everything that we do, including the seminars and, and you know, certainly within the gyms. I mean, I think this is just an exciting time because there's so much opportunity now for people who want to become coaches 
and who are curious about, you know, the apprenticeships. I tell everyone it's really, um, it's a great opportunity, but at the same time, it's highly competitive. And so mm -hmm. we have to be, you know, you have to be personable, you have to be self-motivated, right? That's kind of what we walked away with um, as a tip for them. And for people who are interested in opening up one of these gyms, um, you spoke about like, you didn't realize how much support you were going to get from this company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, you know, people are always surprised by when they, when they join us, um, and they see how many of us are there to help them through the process. Um, you're going to be opening 20 gyms, Brent. You're going to be a busy Go. man. You're going to need a lot of help. That's right. That's you know, right. And you know, it's going to go it, and, because it's going to have to, it's going to have to go beyond coaching. You know, I'm going to need people to manage certain markets. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there's going to be even more opportunities. It's a great time to become a starting strength coach. That's and right. in part by people like you. Well, one thing I want to make sure that we give people um, before we log off is your full impression of Mark Ripito. So I'm going to have oh, you. Ela, that's oh, been done Brent, so many Brent, times. But it's never been done with me. Now, hold on a minute. <sighs> okay. Now, imagine you're Rip and you're talking to me and I'm in New York. We're going to sign <laughs> off. <laughs> We're going to sign off. And you're, <laughs> you'll, I'll let you be Rip and, you know, sign off on this podcast. All right, I got to get into character. Hang on. I know that. Go ahead. Okay. Let's see here. Nina, you need to gain some weight. And it'd be a whole lot easier for you to gain weight if you weren't having to walk everywhere in Manhattan. You know, the Big Apple. Okay. <laughs> You know, you'd be, you would be a hell of a lifter at 225. <laughs> you know what? You'd be a hell of a lifter. <laughs> yeah, I think that, uh, I think that's what you need to go ahead and do. You know, when you want to do that, all right, fine by me. You know, this isn't communist China, although it's becoming that way. So, you know, we got these elections rigged now. Just a matter of time. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. That's right. Bye. Okay. Bye.